I'm not into smart cities, but uh, I want to take you on a ride. I want to take you on a probably a roller coaster ride about what is really happening with us, around us, and what technology is leading us. So, if you would start about smart cities and a talk, we probably start something like this, and uh, I could talk to you about the future of cities in you know 2025 and uh, 2050, and this is a scene out of Star Trek. You know, Gene Roddenberry uh, invented all these things and this vision about humanity and uh, star travel and all these uh, wonderful technologies which now inspired a generation of developers for 3D printing and all these kind of technologies. But I don't want to talk about this. So I think there's something... I think we have to think a little bit deeper, and I think... Well, maybe it's not about smart cities, but it's about smart citizens. And what about smart citizens outsmart our future cities? I think there's so much more going on in everything around us and on a very personal level that I don't think we can really plan for the future of cities very easily, or as we do right now. So I want to take you to something which is, you know, determined my life for the last couple of years from the mobile technology and what's happening there and what's happening really around us. So mobile has become a remote control to our lives. We press a button, magic happens, a taxi arrives, all of these little things. And we might call it apps, and it's like this super technology, but I think the whole app economy is already over. But it's really this internet of things and everything around us which is happening, which is great. You know, we have sensors, we can determine our health and, you know, put a map on where asthma uh, is happening, and that's a great service. But we're also starting to get into sensors. You know, there's a company called Mayo, and uh, you know, rather than if you want to jog and you have your iPhone or something like that and say, oh, I don't like that song, and you have like skip or so, you can just do like that. Skip, play, or do something with your muscles because it will censor your attention in your muscles. Crazy technology is already out here. It's already what we have in uh, Kickstarter, and you can buy it. Obviously, you know, mobile, it becomes into mobility, self-driving cars, whether it's Google, Audi, a lot of the, you know, obviously German uh, companies and also Japanese companies are working on that. That's already on the streets today, and we see when we have it and we can really apply it, but it's really something people are working on in the labs. In Japan, who is here from Japan? Um, there's a company, um, you're aware, which is dealing with uh, brain control interfaces to determine the mood of you in this uh, particular moment and then play the music according to your mood, um, sensing your brain activity. Um, so Intel called something uh, the ghost of computing. So it's the internet, everything around us, it's maybe not a very uh, good term, very positive, but it's really so, it's so invisible, but it's there. You can feel it, you can kind of interact with it. And there are some things, and I want to take you on, on some of the uh, technology which is already in the labs today. So this, for example, is a chip which is just a millimeter in size, and you need like this little package around it that it can still be on a motherboard, but it's just a millimeter. And uh, we have body sensors, so your activity can uh, be measured, and it, you, know, you can take a shower with these things. It's already there, people use it. And uh, well, if we go into miniaturization of computing, you know, you have drones and these you know, quadcopters and so on, but there's these mini drones which can already inject medicine, for example, and the U.S. military and probably other governments are, you know, toying with this or are really uh, playing with this. Um, you know, other drones, obviously a lot of, you know, even uh, good research comes from military, but maybe not the best use of it, but at least there's some, it's already there, people use it. And here, now we are starting, if you look at technology, uh, normally you have, uh, you know, the German ice uh, trains, the high-speed trains, maybe it's the Japanese, so there's like, if you are in technology and in, in computer, you have more slow. Every 18 months, everything is doubling. Every, you know, um, we have uh, hard disk falling in size and, and price. But uh, so there's sort of the speed train coming towards us. And if we are familiar with, you know, every year there's a new iPhone and all these kind of new innovations, uh, we are, are familiar with this pattern. But if you take a step back, there's like five other trains coming. So there's a artificial intelligence. Uh, robotics, nanotech, biotech, all of these technologies are getting into this exponential law. And so we're going into nanotech and biotech. Here, for example, we have started to build E. coli computers, computers in bacteria. 
So London Imperial College, uh, and once you start to have a little on-off switch in a little bacteria, you can start to build computers. So we are getting into that whole new era. Okay, it's still in a lab, but another step here is that you have a storage in DNA of 700 terabyte in one gram of DNA. Harvard put this together, and there's uh, some musicians, um, or an uh, they, he put a whole musical into DNA, and uh, he can write it already, but nobody can read it. But the next couple of years, somebody will hear, hopefully the music is good, I don't know when they find it. Um, but this is already here today. So I want to put this into a time reference somehow, you know, because it's in the lab, how, how fast will it come? And uh, try to put this together. And so in the next 10 years, the computing power of an iPhone or Android phone you have in your pocket, in the next 10 years, this will be the size of a blood cell. So whatever computing power you have in your pocket right now will be the size of a blood cell. That means maybe in 10 years you can drink and learn Japanese or you, you know, whatever you didn't learn at two years, you can now uh, just kind of have some other forms of interaction and the computing power is so small, it's all around us, it will be almost unimaginable. If you think back only eight or nine years we started with this whole smartphone, iPhone thing, and look what happened. Gigantic industry started and it changed our lives. We're like this head down economy. Well, that may change uh, hopefully soon, but just the computing power, the raw power, will change dramatically. And uh, on our way to this uh, you know, singularity event when uh, technology is taking over humans or the intelligence, there's you know, a couple of steps. So we, you know, as you know, Google Glass didn't really make it into the market. We're already talking about contact lenses. You look into this, you know, what, what's happening in different kind of industries in the technology. Um, you know, again, the CPU power is uh, dramatically shrinking. And then, um, who is familiar with AI? Watson, computer from IBM, is you know, probably the, a quarter of the size of this room. And uh, a year ago, uh, Bill um, um, won in a computer show, uh, not in a computer show, in a normal show, Jeopardy. And so a first computer who kind of smashed the competition and uh, really won all of these uh, complicated questions about uh, quizzes. So to say. So very intelligent, super hyper, hyper uh, artificial intelligence. But if we follow that, the size of this computing power will also in the next 10 years will be the size of an iPhone today. And if you follow the narrative, that means in 20 years from now, this super gigantic computer will also be the size of a blood cell. 20 years from now. That's around the corner. So if this is all happening, and we put this on a timeline. You know, we have these sensors all around us. You know, you know already have your Fitbit and your fuel bands and so on. Sensors will be like dust. It's already there's a, actually funny. There's a dust network company which puts sensors in streets, and then the street calls basically up. Oh, there was too many trucks today. I have a pothole here or something like that. All of these things will be coming intelligent. Everything around us. We don't really know what that means, but think about every little. Thing has some of these sensors in it and we have to make sense of this whatever fancy word big data uh, is in there and all of these new things come into the market and obviously there's a lot of production here in Asia and, and a lot of um, very much uh, very intelligent people who bring this uh, to us around the world but I think we have to see where this will end and um, or where the next step is so I, I show you premiere today this is the iPhone 20 Well, you might not see it, but it will all be going away. You know, if everything goes away, how do we start computing? So you have kind of a contact lens, right? You have the biggest, obviously, 4K display. You have even a camera in there, so it's bi-directional. Um, the um, BCI, the brain control, is maybe just a tattoo under your you know, eyebrow. You know, if there's a microphone, it maybe it's an implant and uh, she will have a hair extension with the next, you know, IMTA, the next uh, 5G network. I might not have a long, uh, <laughs> good connectivity. Uh, she will have some more advantage. And whatever you still need as a CPU, if at all, it, you, it's just like maybe the size of an um, earring or something like that. So, Alan Kay, who was really came, coming up with the you know, concept of uh, iPad and all these, he was an amazing, brilliant guy, said, well, 
you know, you, the best way to invent the future is to, or predict the future is to invent it. And if I, you know, zoomed in uh, the front, now let's zoom back and um, put you to a little village in Tuscany. The, you know, there's a villa in Medici in the Renaissance time, and it was sort of a melting pot of ideas. And you have Leonardo da Vinci and all these greatest artists of the time having sort of this, you know, creative collision of people coming together and Today we would probably say maybe that was the first maker space or you know, and, and, you know, a collab working space. It was endorsed by a family and people meet and you know, probably for food and some good education or so they could kind of create art and uh, new things. And so now there's companies, Autodesk, or there's uh, you know, maker cities for example and, and we run a lab in Hamburg about these things. So um, I, we are working on something and I want to invite basically the 20 smartest cities in the world and say, okay, come to Hamburg and every city will bring a container which like the coolest startups, the coolest and the best uh, government projects, artificial projects. I want to invite Hong Kong to participate and bring a container and show this to the world and let's have a lab of where we really can design and, and bring cities in the world because uh, once we bring everything, we have this, you know, the knowledge of today and with hopefully amazing, you know, two people from Hong Kong and two from San Francisco and, you know, a group of uh, international artists in a, in a kind of a conference time, um, I think we can really maybe design what the future will be in. Because if we are all this intelligent and we don't, you know, we, we, are, we become running around computers, well, should we, are we really designing cities for us, or are we designing cities in a very linear way with everything we know? It's going to be very tough. And I think we have to just kind of put this together, the knowledge and the, um, let's say, appreciate that obviously cities are built for people. And uh, if people are changing so rapidly in everything around us, how can we even envision what a city of the future will be without looking at us and you and me? So I think it's really up to us to you know, ask questions and ask really, uh, how do we want to, want to live? What's our utopian point of view? Uh, there was a conference in Hong Kong two days ago, WISE conference, a new word, not smart, so even wiser, very great. So I'm, I'm curious about the outcome from Hong Kong. Um, but I think we are at a very crucial point in history where it's a very slim chance. We have all this opportunity, but I think we, we can go just this way and there's all this abundance of, you know, positive and technology is great for everybody and there's opportunity in startups or we go this way and this leads to Skynet, Terminator and maybe a, a more uh, dystopian point of view. The technology is there, it's up to us as humans to really work with it. It's a tool, it's a hammer. You can do great things or you can do not so great things. And I want to close with a quote from Steve Jobs and it's really, technology alone is not enough. It's technology married with the liberal arts, married with humanity, uh, that yields to the best results. And that's what makes our hearts sing. And I think that's what we want to strive for. So without that, thank you.